spirit today. I don't want to interrupt that flow. I just want you to just obey the Lord. The giving. I know we have online giving of other methods. Maybe have all three with you. Just bring it up today. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the giving today. Bless the Lord. Bless all of those in this household. Prosper them in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 So we are planning to do the vacation Bible school. How many kids want to have vacation Bible school? Yeah! Woo! All right, you guys are so quiet. How many adults want to have adult Bible school? Great, you guys need to stay in here right after we dismiss the kids this morning. Um, so we have a, a sign-up sheet. Some of you got one on Wednesday night. 
And uh, if you will, just take one of these home with you today or fill it out today. Leave it here. Um, we're going to give a couple of options for the Vacation Bible School. And so if you guys would like to have three nights of Vacation Bible School, you can check three nights. If you want to have five nights and have five nights with no kids, parents, what do you say? Yes. 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 Oh, we're so excited about that. Uh, so we're going to give you guys the option to do three nights of BBS or five nights of BBS. The dates that we have uh, so far, it's going to be the week of June 14th, and it will be from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., either three nights of that week or five nights. So grab one of these today, fill it out for me, and uh, you can leave it back there on the table, or you can get it to our children's pastor, which I'm about to call to the stage and let her make a few announcements. So I want to say something really quickly. We've been in this church now going on four years. And there is an excitement that I can announce that we have a children's pastor, someone who has taken the role, someone who was crazy enough to accept my offering uh, to do this. And I'm so excited about this. I know that they are pumped up about it. And so, would you guys help me welcome our children's pastor to say, Carmen Santiago.
but they don't really see what it kind of does once it leaves here. So the offering that we take here in Children's Church will go into the children's ministry. So we we'll want to find, buy some of those cool prizes for them to purchase. Um, just you know, being able to do fun things with them um, outside of church um, when that time comes. Um, that's what we're looking for. And all we're asking from you is quite simple. It's just to pray. Um, pray for the kids to be able to take in what's being taught to them and pray for the teachers that are teaching them. Um, Mom and I are truly excited to see what God is going to do for our children and through our children. Praise the Lord. That is so exciting. How many of you kids are excited to venture back to Anchor Island? Not adults. No, there's not snacks back there yet. So, it's still fun. so um, I'm, guys, I'm excited. I am super excited. I, you guys, it's been a long time coming for me to be able to do things like this in this church. And um, there's one more. Announcement. Oh, one more announcement. I'm sorry, I did forget. Um, we are going to be having a baby shower for Allison May 29th. Um, it's a Saturday, and we will be sending out a formal invitation to just go. Awesome. So, how many kids are ready to hit the island? I can't hear you guys. Me. I don't hear you guys. Me. I don't think the kids are waiting. I said, how many kids are ready to go to Anchorage Island? Me. Let me hear you. Yeah. 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 At this time, we'll go ahead and we will dismiss our children back to Anchorage Island. You guys be safe on your journey back there, and I'm so excited for what God has for you guys today. Amen? Follow our church Facebook page so that you can share our live stream so you don't have to hold your phone. Yeah. Remind me to help you with that today. Yeah. Hallelujah. Jimmy, you don't want to go to the island? Okay. Lord, I can't preach while I'm in the sun. My need is right. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So exciting. So, I wanted to share this too. Jerry has agreed to paint everything back there to make it look like an island. That's <laughs> 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 all right. Praise the Lord. Volunteers. Hallelujah. You know, I told Jerry yesterday, so Jerry and I came over yesterday, we did some, we did some cutout work and, and some painting. And, uh, and I told Jerry that, you know, I was really looking for a new love-hate relationship in my life, and I found one yesterday. And so, for all the professional painters out there, God bless you. I pray for you guys. The anointing is not there with me, and I believe that to the professionals in the future. So, but praise the Lord. We've got two rooms ready to put new flooring. How many of you like the color? Did anybody notice the color in the foyer? Chris is like, I didn't know we painted that. Like, everybody's looking now, like, man, maybe we should have just left it. Just, you know. <laughs> you know. Um, but uh, we worked really hard on that. We've still got some stuff to do and a few things left. And uh, Andy is going to help us out and get that floor put in hopefully this week. Um, so I'm super excited about that. So if you guys didn't know it, Andy has a business. Um, he builds all kinds of stuff. Like, it's amazing <coughs> the work he does. So for all of your home needs, I'm going to advertise Andrew Neal over here. But yeah. The name of the business, but there he is there. Yeah, he's waving, but nobody on the camera can see, but that's okay. And uh, so I'm praying now. I've been praying for God to send us some handymen, and God has done that. And now I'm praying for God to send us some painters. I don't want to paint anything ever again. Um, I had fun rolling, but cutting in, and uh, uh nope, not for me. So that's, uh, yeah, no, me and Jerry, I've got to paint right here, I guess. So, that brings me to my message this morning, and, 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 and I literally, I got up this morning, I had a message prepared, I was going to talk about abundance this morning, I was all excited because I had studied what the word, you know, abundance meant in the Greek, and what the word abundance meant in Greek, and Hebrew, and all this kind of stuff, and I got up this morning, and God's like, yeah, you're changing that, we're not doing that today, and I was like, alright, praise the Lord. And so he led me over to the book of Joel, chapter 3, verse 14. So if you've got your Bibles with you this morning, I'd ask that you turn with me to Joel, chapter 3, verse 14. When you get there, high-five your neighbor, stand with me for the reading of the word, and shout amen. 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 Not from the distance. 
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Job chapter 3, verse 14 says in the Christian Standard Bible, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you this morning that we can gather in your presence. I thank you, God, for the work that you're doing. I thank you, Lord, that as we have stood in the valley of decisions, God, that we've been able to seek you and search for you to hear your voice, to, to be encouraged and be in, in, inspired to work harder and further for the kingdom of God. I praise you, God, that in everything that we do, Lord, you're there with us, that you're right there by our side, God. And I pray this morning that you would use me as a humble and a willing vessel, that you would crucify my flesh, that you would remove every and anything that is of me, God, and just let the Spirit work through me. And God, I love you this morning, and I praise you, God, I'm so excited about what you're doing in this church. You, the children's ministry is growing. The youth ministry is going. And I, and I praise you for all those things, God. And I know that we are on the verge. We're on the verge of revival. And I can feel it. I felt it this morning, God, when I walked in. As soon as I stepped through the door this morning, I can feel the spirit of revival stirring in my spirit. And I praise you for that, oh God. And I praise you this morning. I love you. I thank you in the church. Say amen. 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 You may be seated this morning in the presence of the Almighty. I'm going to read a little bit more scripture here. I'm going to go back and I'm going to read Joel chapter 3, verse 1 uh, through verse 16 so that I can shed some more light on this. But Joel chapter 1, chapter 3, verse 1 says, Yes, in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and take them to the valley of Jehoshaphat. I will enter into judgment with them there because of my people, my inheritance, Israel. The nations have scattered the Israelites in foreign countries and divided up my land. They cast lots for my people, and they bartered a boy for a prostitute and sold a girl for wine to drink. And also Tyre, Sidon, and all the territories of Philistia. What are you to me? Are you paying me back for trying to get even with me? I will quickly bring retribution on your hands, for you took my silver and gold and carried my finest treasures to your temples. You sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks to remove them far from their own territory. Look, I am about to rouse them up from the place where you sold them. And I will bring retribution on your hands. I will sell your sons and daughters to the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabians, to a distant nation, for the Lord has spoken. Proclaim this among the nations, prepare for holy war. Rouse the warriors, let all the men of war advance and attack. Beat your plows into swords and your pruning knives into spears. Let even the weakling say, I am a warrior. Come quickly, all you surrounding nations, gather yourselves, bring down your warriors there, Lord. Let the nations be roused and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit down. To judge all the surrounding nations, swing the sickle because the harvest is ripe. Come and trample the grapes because the wine press is full. The wine vats overflow because the wickedness of the nations is extreme. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will cease their shining. The Lord will roar from Zion and make his voice heard from Jerusalem. Heaven and earth will shake. But the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the Israelites. There's a lot in that scripture, and there's a lot that is said in this, and a lot of it is foreshadowing and foretelling of prophecy yet to happen in our land. There is stuff in here that the Lord was showing me that, that what, what I just read to you, we are living a lot of that now. There's nations against nations. There's people that are being scattered. Look at what the pandemic did. It scattered the body of Christ, didn't it? It kept us in our homes. Now, we may not think that a big deal. I'm not saying that, you know, COVID's not real or anything like that because it is. I had it. It was horrible, but praise God, I was healed from it. But what I want you to see this morning before I get into what, I, what the Lord has given me is that there will come a day when the nations will rise against nations and they will try to scatter us. Look at our country today. Politician against politician. They're trying to spread the people out 
They're trying to divide the nation. I don't care what they say, that they're wanting peace and they're wanting uh, a reconciliation and they're wanting healing. That's a bunch of malarkey. That's a bunch of nonsense if I ever heard it. Because what I'm telling you today is that if their actions don't line up with the word of God, then their, their speaking is false. We need people that will raise up. This scripture tells us today that if you're a weakling, proclaim yourself a warrior. Anybody ever have weak moments in your life before? The book of Job tells us that we can proclaim that we are a warrior. And I think that that's where we need to get as Christians today. We need to get in a place where we're okay with proclaiming and putting a title on ourselves of a warrior. I'm a gentle giant. <laughs> I may not fall gently, but I'm a gentle giant. I'm good until you start messing with my family. I'm good until you start messing with my flock. I'm good until you start messing with people that I deeply and truly love. Then you get a side of me that's not very pleasant. Then you get the warrior. And it's okay to be that warrior. I want you to know that because there are going to be times where we've got to go into battle. And I'd rather go into battle as a warrior than a weakling. Amen? Amen. But I want to share some more scripture with you this morning. And it's going to tie into exactly what I'm going to talk to you about today. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 10, it says, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by his spirit and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were a great many of them on the surface of the valley, and they were very dry. Then he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? I replied, Lord God, only you know. He said to me, prophesy concerning these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says to these bones. I will cause your breath to enter you and you will live. I will put tendons on you, make flesh grow on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you so that you come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded. While I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. As I looked, tendons appeared on them, flesh grew, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man. Say to it, let's see here. Say to it, this is what the Lord God says. Breathe, breath. Come from the four winds and breathe into these slain so that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded. The breath entered them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. Everybody knows the story of Ezekiel and the dry bones, the valley of the dry bones, right? There's something that God showed me today that I've never even paid attention to. What did Ezekiel have to do first before he began to prophesy? He stood in the valley. He was taken up by the Spirit of God. And he, was, he stood in this valley. And he had to make a decision. I have never paid attention to the fact that Ezekiel had to make a decision before he even began to speak. Before the prophecy could even be spoken, and before anything could even begin to happen in the physical, in the spiritual, in the natural, whatever you want to call it, Ezekiel first had to make a decision. And what I want to talk to you today about is being in the valley of decision and five things that keep us from making forward progress. You know, I came across an article here recently, and I was, I was kind of skimming through it, I was reading through it, and there was something that jumped off the page at me, and it said, if God is God, then follow him. If God is God, then follow him. How many of us have ever struggled with following God? Anybody ever had a hard time following God? We think we hear his voice, but what do we do? We stop. Maybe because we're afraid. Maybe because we don't know the outcome. Habakkuk wanted to know, God, what are you doing? And God's like, look, it's not for you to know exactly what I'm going to do because when I'm ready to unfold my plan, you'll see my plan. And that's what God does to us. God does, if God would have told me almost four years ago exactly what I was going to go through in this church and all the way to this day, you would not see me here today. I'd be like, nope, that's too much. I'm sorry. I've got better things to do. I don't want to deal with that nonsense. That's why God doesn't reveal his plans fully until the time is right. There is a season in which God will unfold his plans. Right. You see, there's so many of us that are facing some top, tough, high decisions in life. In the book of Job, God said the multitudes, multitudes of the valley of decisions. The valley of decisions can be a very confusing place. 
Has anyone ever been in a valley before? A physical valley? Okay? Yeah. I, I want to tell you about an experience that I had one time, and this was my first experience going into a valley. But we were in Alaska, and we, we went up river, and I thought, you know, beautiful, all this, very exciting. And then we got in the boat, and we were hunting caribou. We got in the boat, and, and the two guys that I was with, they're like, now listen, we're going to climb up this hill, we're going to go down in this valley. But remember the path that you took to get down to this valley, because if you don't pay attention, you can get mixed up and not find your way in this valley. Because this valley was huge, it was long, it was wide, it was, you know, mountains on it, you know, all around me. And I thought, now, now how, do I, how would I forget this? Well, sure enough, I got down in that valley, and I sort of turned around looking at everything, and everything looked the same, and I got a little disoriented. And I thought, man, this, this, this okay, something's not right here. But thank God the two guys that I was with, they knew where they were going. But I want you to see something, and I want you to hear me clearly on this. When you get in the valley of decision, and you begin to get disoriented, or you begin to get lost, or you begin to get scared or afraid, there's a beacon that you can look up to, and that's Jesus Christ. Yes. When you get in the valley of decision, you can look up to Jesus Christ. And know that even though you might be in that valley with the multitude, your whole family may be in there. Your friends may be in there with you. May, your enemy is going to be in there with you. Because where you go, the devil has an enemy to send with you. Because he does not want you to succeed. Yeah. But I want you to know that when you get in the valley of decision, that you're not alone. Yeah. I have seen so many posts on Facebook lately that people are talking about they're alone. They're scared. They're afraid. They're going through this. They're going through that. They're having a hard time. They're having a tough time. They're having a difficult time. Where is the church? You see, in the valley of decision, I want you to know that when, if Christina goes into the valley of decision, then the body of Christ goes in the valley with her. I want you to know that we are more than just friends and just a family in here, but we are the body of Christ. That when one of them goes in the valley, so does the rest of us. That we go with them because the Bible has called us to bear, to carry the burdens of one another and so fulfill the law of Christ. Yeah. That when the shepherd leads, leads the sheep down into the valley, he goes with them. He may not be in the front of them, but he's got one of those sheep out front and know where they're going because he's trained them and taught them. And he's at the back. He may be at the back or he may have a hireling at the front. He may have an associate pastor at the front of his church leading the people into the valley because a lot of the times the shepherd will watch from the back. I'm not saying that I stand right over you to see everything you do, but I'm standing over you in prayer to cover you. Exactly. Because you're going to go down to the valley of decision. I can promise you that. Some of you may be there today. I know that we're in, we're there today. My wife, my family, we're in the valley of decision. We're praying for God to come through with a miracle for us to buy a house in the next 12, 13, 12 days. We need to be under contract so that we can move out of the house we have now and not rent another year. But I praise God that even in the valley of decision, there's something that gets done. You first make a decision, and when you make the decision, that is when the Lord, the Holy Spirit, will come upon you, and you will start marching out of the valley of decision. Yes. But let me tell you this. It's okay to be there. It's okay for you to stay in the valley of decision because there's growth that happens there. There's a lot of things that take place in the valley of decision. Now, in the valley that I went in, in the physical valley, in the beginning of that valley, it stunk bad. It smelled really bad. Uh -huh. And there was a combination of things that happened there. You had water that was coming in from one of the sloughs that was just kind of a runoff, and then you had, there were dead animal carcasses. Mm -hmm. And when there's dead stuff, it smells. Mm -hmm. But I want you to know this. Sometimes it might be your flesh that's dying that needs to come off. Yeah. Let me say that again. Sometimes in the valley of decision, you might think that all these things around you smell bad, but it might be the flesh that God's trying to crucify and kill off of you so that you can continue to march through the valley. Amen. Sometimes your flesh can be your own worst enemy. My flesh has gotten in my way so many times. Anybody ever made a decision based off your feelings? Can I tell you that we're all wrong in doing that? And I can tell you why. Because the word of God says that we are to try the spirit. We're to seek his wisdom, seek his voice. And I'm not saying you're bad people because you've made decisions based off of your emotions and feelings. I've done the same thing. I can't tell you how many times I've decided to go eat in a certain place because of how hungry I was. I can't tell you how many times I've made a decision about going somewhere about how I felt that day or how I felt that morning when I got over or the fact that maybe I don't want to drive two and a half hours today or I don't want to drive three, four hours today. I just want to go somewhere close. We make decisions based upon our feelings. And I'm not saying that we're wrong. Mm -hmm. But when we do so, we're missing out on what God has for us. Hallelujah. 
James says in James chapter 1, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You see, if you stay in the valley of decision, now here's the part. It's okay to stay in the valley of decision for a little bit, but don't stay too long. Do not stay too long. How many children, how many parents in here have had children that they would stay in their dirty diaper all day long if you didn't force them to change it? Yep. You know why? That's their mess. That's their stuff. And they're comfortable in it. I want you to know today, and I want you to hear me today, it's okay to go into the valley of decision, but don't get comfortable. Don't take your bag of tools in there and start building you somewhere to sit down and somewhere to lay your head. Don't, don't take your tools in there and go ahead and build you a, a, a pen to put your animals in so that you have something to eat. Don't go in there and build that five-star kitchen. Don't be putting a roof on the house. Don't get comfortable in the valley of decision because what will happen is you'll eventually get into the mindset that James was talking about in James chapter 1 where you become a double-minded person and then you are unstable. That's a bad place to get to. That's a horrible place to get to. You see, the valley of decision, it's good, but you see, God is not the author of confusion. Yeah. He's not the author of confusion. So when you when you notice, when you're in the valley of decision, when confusion begins to set in, you better get out. That's your time. That's your cue. Y'all know that when I say that I'm wrapping up my sermon, we've got one to 15 more minutes to go, right? Y'all probably figured most of that out. Y'all know that when we pray and I tell you guys that I love you and have a wonderful Sunday, you're done, right? That's it. Service is now concluded. Amen. That's exactly what it is in the Valley of Decision. God will begin to speak and the only way that you will hear God in the Valley of Decision is if you be quiet and you stand still. Yes. The Bible says that those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall soar on wings like eagles. Yes. There is, and, and I almost, I wanted to put the evil stuff in the sermon today, but I left it out because it, it's a whole sermon in itself. Mm -hmm. Listen for the voice of the Lord. I can go and I can ring that bell on that wall right there, and they will hear that back there, and they will know that that's an indicator that it's time to come from back there up here. Mm -hmm. Listen for the voice of God, because if you miss the voice of God in the valley of decision, you're going to get stuck, and that's a bad place to get stuck. And there's a consequence for not making. Let me. Let me this one, I had to sit there when I, when I typed this out and I wrote, I, I wrote this out in my notes this morning. I had to sit here and swallow this one myself. It's worse to not make a decision than it is to make a decision. Just because anybody ever thought, well, if I don't do something about it, it'll just go away? Anybody ever thought, well, maybe if I, I don't make a decision on this over here or I don't fix this, it'll be fine? There's a hole in the floor back here that we hadn't fixed yet. We thought, okay, it'll be good until we get done. Well, Caleb got in there and he made a bigger hole. So when you don't do things and you wait and you hope for the best of it and you say, well, okay, if I leave this alone, if I don't make this decision that God is trying to tell me that it's time that I start in ministry or it's time that I take this job over here or it's time that I focus on this or it's time that I do, if we don't make the decision, we are worse off than if we do make a decision. Right. If you sit there, the Lord will not force you to move because his word tells us that he's given us our own free will to choose to do as we please. Yeah. He does not force us. There are sometimes I really wish he'd come with the floss water and, and, and swat it behind me to get me moving to make a decision. Now I've gotten a lot better about that and I've gotten a lot better about making decisions and I've gotten better about seeking the Lord. But just because you ignore the problem, just because you procrastinate and put off the decision, does not mean that decisions won't be made. Even in your lack of making a decision, you've made a decision. Yes. You have decided to sit down. The kingdom does not tell us to sit down. The kingdom does not tell us to run the race with endurance and run it until we feel like we've done enough and then park it. The Bible says to run the race with endurance, which also means that when God is giving us decisions to make, we've got to seek his voice. Amen. We've got to hear from him. The decisions are going to be made one way or the other. Either you are going to make them or life will make them for you. Anybody ever had life make decisions for you? How'd that turn out? Do we want no, no shouting out? No, no amen in there. I've been there. I don't think I'm throwing stones because I've, I've done the same thing before. You can ask Allison. There's things that she was like, God, if you don't get him by the back of the head and shake him and get him to wake up and make some decisions and be the priest of this home and be the man of the house, 
And thank God he got me and he got a hold of me and he pushed me to the forefront and he moved me to where now I am the head of my household and now I am the priest of my home. And when I make decisions, I might make a wrong decision, but I'm going to go to the Lord first and find out what he wants me to do. Yeah. And guess what? I'm not perfect and sometimes I miss it. And that's okay because his mercy and grace are waiting right there for me. Yes, yes. But I want to talk about five characteristics this morning. Or five reasons, rather, excuse me. Five reasons why we don't make the right decisions. If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, we don't feel like it. Mm. Ooh, ouch. Mm. Man, that, hurt, that hurt me. Mm. Y'all, that hurt me. My leg already hurts. My shoulder hurts. But that would hurt. How many times have we said, ah, I don't feel like it. Husbands, laundry, I don't feel like it. Both hands on that one. Amen. I can shout all day on that one. How many times have we said, I just don't feel like making this decision today. I don't feel like getting down on my knees. I don't feel like getting on my face before God. I don't feel like sacrificing. I don't feel like staying away from the kitchen and pushing the plate away. I just don't feel like it today. You see, there's this little thing inside of us that will lie to us, and that's our emotions. Emotions are fleeting. You might be happy one second and sad the next. You might be really joyful over here or ticked off in the next. So when we, when, we, when we do this thing, we make these decisions based off of I don't feel like it, we're telling God, I don't care what, you're, what you have for me right now. I'm not interested in it. This, this is tough. And I'm not, look, this is hard for me when I put this together, so don't think I'm trying to beat on y'all. Okay? I love y'all, but I want y'all to see this. But what we're doing there is when we say, I don't feel like it, we're telling God, listen, what you have for me right now, I don't feel like it. What you've got for me right now, I don't feel like doing anything to receive it. What you've got, what's coming for me right now, no, it's not for me right now because I'm okay where I'm at. I'm good in my own life. I, I, yeah, it needs to change, but I'm good right now. I don't feel like it. Let me encourage you to do this. Get out of your feelings. Children, how many, how many, how, oh my gosh, parents, how many times there are children in their feelings? Just the other day, I thought, my God, I thought if I could put a zipper on Isaac and Jenna's mouth, because they were both in their feelings, they were both in their emotions, he would look at her, huh? well, she looked at me, and she'd cry, and then he'd look at her, and she'd cry, and then he would sit down on this side of the couch, and then all of a sudden, that was her part of the couch, and I thought, oh my God, you know what I did, I was like, I don't feel like dealing with that, <laughs> I was like, where's Allison, oh, hey, where are you? Where, oh, she's in the kitchen in the chair rocking. You know, she's not uncomfortable. But I'm sitting there thinking, like, I don't want to deal with this. I don't feel like it right now. God, why don't you do something about it? Why don't you just let them sleep? Just, you know, put them in a slumber like you did, uh, you know, Adam. Hey, just go to sleep. Be quiet. I don't feel like it. But that's not how God wants us to perceive what we're facing and dealing with. We made the decision to have children. Uh -huh. Now they're our problems. Amen. We've got to deal with it whether we want to or not. We make the decision every single day to get out of the bed. There are days where I say, I don't feel like it. I got up this morning, my body hurt. I fell through that floor yesterday, my body hurts. And I was like, I just don't feel like it. And I'm like thinking, I'm 36 years old, I shouldn't be hurting like this. But then I'm like, 36 years old, I should have enough sense not to step where it says, do not walk. So that's my fault. But I didn't feel like it. So we get these times in our life and in our spiritual walk with God that we say, you know what? The word of God is always going to be there for me. It's always going to be there. I can go grab it whenever I want it or whenever I feel like it. The word of God does not say have a relationship with me when you're feeling high and good and all the rise. It says to have a relationship with me when you're on top of the mountain and when you're in the body, bottom of the valley. Yeah. It says that you need to have a relationship with me when you feel like it and you don't feel like it. Yeah. So I want to encourage you today that when you don't feel like it, you better find a way to feel like it. Because God might be wanting to release blessing over you. Yeah. The Israelites didn't feel like walking in the desert, so what they do? They whined. They walked around for 40 years. Say it with me. I feel like it. I feel like it. Praise the Lord. Number two, I love this one. How many of you want to know what's going to happen before you do something? Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Number two, we are unsure of the outcome. We want to know, God, where's my enemy at? Where's my stumbling blocks? 
Where's my roadblocks? Where's this road going? How many of you have ever been on a road trip with children? And they, are we there yet? 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 And are we there yet? I gotta go fast for you. Are we there yet? Are we there? I'm hungry. He looked at me. He touched me. He breathed in my. Are we there yet? We get all of that, but guess what? That's exactly how we are to God. The same thing. God, where are you taking me? Where are we going? What you want me to do here? Where are we going? Uh, uh, what, what is this over here? What happened that there? Well, are we there yet? Is this what you want me? Is this where you want me to be? Don't you think God gets tired of hearing that from us? Yeah. You see, this is what God wants, and this is me telling you this. This is my feeling, my thoughts. And, and this is just how I think. He wants us to trust him. Yes. And just go where he wants us to go. Yes. Anybody familiar with Jonah? Yes. Where did he want Jonah to go? He wanted him to go over here to toss us. Or, uh, uh, I, I, I forgot. Yeah. He wanted Nineveh. Thank you. He wanted Jonah to go to Nineveh. But Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Jonah wanted to get away from Nineveh because he was like, just wipe them out. God, they're the worst, messed up, jacked up people. I ain't got time for that. So when we ask God, I, I need to know all this, sometimes he'll put you in something to get you to your destination that you don't want to be in. Sometimes when you've just got to know, he will block you off from the world so that you can't see, see that. you can't hear nothing other than what he wants you to see, hear, or smell. See. He locked Jonah. Y'all don't believe he locked him in the belly of that fish? He put him in there. That fish wasn't just swimming along one day and thought, hmm, maybe I'll, I'll try human today. I've never had that before. This is a new item on the menu, nice little restaurant here. I think I'll try that today. There was a plan. You have got to trust the plan that God has before you. Amen. If I had not trusted the plan that God had for me here as the pastor of this church, I would not be here today. Yes, there was about 38% of stubbornness that was in that plan that I just, I'm not going to quit, I'm not going to bow down, I'm not going to lose, I'm going to win, I'm going to keep going. But if I didn't have faith in God, and if I would have asked him, God, what am I going to encounter along the entire journey? I stopped, and I got my stuff and said, thanks, Lord, I appreciate it, I'm going to go this way. We don't need to know. The Bible didn't tell us today that we're going to die. The Bible didn't tell us that this is the moment because if we knew the exact moment that we were going to die, we would mess up God's plans. No. Because then our flesh would take over and we would want to do everything that we wanted to get done before we left this earth. I have a bucket list. There are things that I want to accomplish before I die. Man. And so I know that over the course of my lifetime, I've got to work on this list. I don't know the day that it's going to happen, but I praise God for the day that it does happen and I don't need to know it. Because there is a time that he will appoint for me to leave this earth and go home. And so what he wants me to do now is he doesn't want me to say, God, I need to know everything that you want me to do. He doesn't want us to ask that. He wants us to say, trust me. He wants our faith to be what drives us forward. And let our faith be what causes us to move forward. I have never in my life remodeled anything. Until this man right here came along. And I trust him. I have learned so much with Jerry that there's not much that I can't do. Now, it may not be as good as Andy can do it. Yeah. But I can do it. And somebody will come along and will help me make it look nice. Man. But I'll tell you this if I'd have never said, I want to learn, or can you show me this? I'd have never learned to do the things that I have now. And I wouldn't have all the tools that I have either. Because then I wouldn't have needed tools because I wouldn't have never asked the question. Yeah. You see, sometimes when you ask God, what do I need? He tells you, just come with me. And as we go along the way, I'm going to show you what you need. Don't ask me what I need to do or, how, or where I need to go or how I need to do this. Just trust me and go along with me. Yeah. And if we can get in that mindset that we don't need to know everything that's going to happen on the way of the journey, our journey would be greater and be more blessed yeah. than if we knew it. Because if we knew everything that was going to come at us in those moments, we would never take a step. Yeah. Yeah. Number three. Oh, I forgot a scripture there. Psalms 119, 105 says, this, let this be your motivation. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Yeah. That is all you need to know. He will light the next step and the next step after that, and then he will light the next step, and the next step, and the next step, and the next step. 
When the Israelites were wandering around the desert, they had the pillar of fire by day, the cloud by day, and the pillar of fire by night. Amen. Guess what they could see? The pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. That's it. They didn't see what was in front of them. They didn't see what was behind them. They didn't see what was on the side of them. He didn't want them to see it because they had jumped ship. They had stopped right there and said, okay, this is good right here in the middle of the desert. We'll figure this out. He didn't want them to see it. Sometimes God will protect you from the things that you don't need to see. Because God knows if you see it, you won't go for it. Hallelujah. Number three. The pressure of the present. You ever been so afraid to make a wrong decision because it's going to affect everybody around you? You ever been afraid as a husband to make a decision for your family that's like, man, if I, make, if I don't do this right, this might end up bad for my family. If I don't get this right over here, it could hurt this over here. Or if I, don't, if I don't do this over here just right, it's going to mess up everything over there. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you this. We know from past experiences that short term can lead to long term problems. So we move beyond wise and prudent to be sure of the present. Don't uproot yourself because of little situations. Hallelujah. Don't let the little things, that's like when, when I had a conversation with my pastor one time, and he said you can do one or two things. Every church has little fires, little things that, you know, little fires. There's a fire in there, there's a fire back there, there's two fires over there, there's fires back there, all these little things that needed to be fixed, right? Little fires. So, I could have come to Jerry, and this is no longer a fire because we put this fire out, praise the Lord. We just in the nick of time before lumber went through the roof. But I could have gone to Jerry and said, look, let's just run around with all these little fires all at one time. Because guess what happens when you start running around? I'm not going to run around, so don't get excited. When you start running from little fire to little fire to little fire to little fire to little fire, little fire, little fire, little fire, you miss the giant fire that's blazing right in the middle. Hallelujah. You miss the giant fire that's right in the middle. The giant fire that is right in the middle is not a bad fire. The giant fire that is in the middle is the Holy Ghost. Amen. This fire over here that's the Holy Ghost, he's wanting you to take your eyes off the little fires. He's wanting you to get your eyes off the little fires because the little ones are distracting you. And he wants you to turn your attention and be drawn to the big fire. Because what happens then, you don't worry about everything that's going on. You don't worry about, okay, I need diapers. I need formula. I need food for this. I got to figure out dinner for this week. I got to get this done. I got to pay these meals over here. I got to do this over here. The laundry needs to be done. You do that all day long, you will be so distracted and so busy that you can't see the big fire in the middle. Hallelujah. Don't worry about the present fire. <laughs> I fell into a burning ring of fire. The flames went higher and higher, didn't they? But guess what? When you get in the middle of that fire, just be reminded that Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they went in there. Yes. And guess what? There was a fourth one that showed up and said, look, all these little things that's going on, you're right in the middle of the fire, but guess what? I'm going to get in here and I'm going to walk with you. That's where the Holy Ghost is, right here. Hello, here it is. The Holy yes. Ghost is yes. right here. He's wanting you to get in the fire with him because when you do that, this fire over here, and this fire over here, and this problem in the present, and this present problem, and this present, none of that matters when you get in the fire with the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost will lead you and guide you, and he'll show you where to go to take care of every single present problem that you have. Hallelujah. Thank you. Don't allow the pressure of the present to produce hasty decisions. But that being said, after you really think it through, get counsel and seek God. Yes. Whew, man. Time does not heal all wounds, and avoiding problems does not make them go away. Yes. Get in the fire with the Holy Ghost. Number four. Pressure from the crowd. There is not a single person in here that will pressure me to make a decision in this church that I don't agree with or that I don't think is anointed by God. Yeah. Y'all notice that I didn't ask anybody to pick the paint color, right? Mm -hmm. I prayed about that. I had some input, some advice from someone. I haven't asked what color Ford put me. There's a reason for that. Sometimes peer pressure can push you off in a direction that God doesn't want you to go. Mm -hmm. Sometimes 
Peer pressure can cause you to make a snap decision that God did not want to happen. I will say this. When you make decisions that doesn't line up with the word of God, God is not going to fully bless it. Amen. There are people and there are pastors that believe that there is the permissive will of God and the perfect will of God. I believe that there is one, the perfect will of God. You're either in it yes. or you ain't. Yeah. There's none of this over here. Well, I'm kind of, I'm getting, I'm, I got a little bit of God's will over here. I, I got my foot in there. Nope, there's none of that. There's none of that halfway in God's will. You either get all the way in or you get all the way out. Right. Every decision that I have ever made in this church has been through prayer and fasting. It may not have been a long fast. It may not have been some big gigantic fast because sometimes God will answer you real quick when you say, okay, I'm going to push things away. But peer pressure, the enemy wants you to listen to peer pressure. Mm -hmm. He wants you to give in to what the world says you need to do. You quit associating with people, didn't you? You quit associating with people? Did you quit associating with people that didn't leave and push you to Jesus? Did you quit associating with people that wouldn't push you to Jesus? Mr. Milton, did you push away people that wouldn't associate you with Jesus? Amen. Kevin? Austin? That's right. Peer pressure is a tool from the enemy to push you into the firing box. Let me rephrase that. I said that wrong. Peer pressure from the enemy pushes you into the kill box. Mm -hmm. Military guys, y'all know what the kill box is, don't you? You ever wanted to be there? Uh-uh. I want you to know that there are people out there today that would love to see you destroyed. Mm -hmm. Emotionally, spiritually, even physically. There are people today that would love to be able to lead you down into a kill box and let the enemy take you. Husbands, wives, pray for and listen to one another. Moms, daughters, moms, sons, dads, sons, all that stuff. Pray together and listen to one another. I trust my wife more than anybody else on the face of this earth. And I know that when it comes to making a decision, it's not peer pressure that comes from her to me. It is discernment from the Holy Spirit. Amen. There is a difference. If you listen to peer pressure and you succumb to peer pressure, you're missing out on what the Spirit has to say to you. You're missing out on what God has for you to hear. God, how many of you God gave a brain? Anybody give, uh, got a brain from God? Y'all get all of them? Yep. God gave every one of us a brain, but he also gave us the Holy Spirit. Yes. He gave us the Holy Spirit so that we wouldn't listen to what the world has to say about what we need to do. I don't see people that are carnally minded to tell me how to pastor this church. No. I'm not going to do that. If I do that, then I shouldn't be up here. I'm going to consult with God on how to pastor the church. You should consult with God for your family, for your life, for everything. No. You can ask me for advice and for guidance, but at the end of the day, I'm going to point you right here. So that when you make your decision, you know that God has anointed it, he has appointed it, and that you're staying right in the will of God for your life, for your family's life, for your children, your wife, your husband, whatever it may be. Amen. Don't let peer pressure cave you in. Don't give in to the majority of what people are saying unless you know that they are rooted and founded in the word of God. Amen. And number five. Oh, I love this one. The comfortable patterns of life. Anybody have, uh, have a favorite vacation spot you like to go to? No. Yep. Everybody have one of those? United yep. States. United, United yep, States. that's right. So Larry loves the vacation in the United States. Praise the Lord. We get into this mindset where we tend to go to the same restaurants. We tend to go to the same vacation places. We tend to do the same hobbies. We tend to do the same things that, that bring us fun because they're comfortable. Mm -hmm. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. But let me show you something here. Before the Israelites left Egypt, they were 
bondage. Mm -hmm. I've been in there for 400 years. Mm -hmm. But all their needs were taken care of. They may not have had everything they wanted, but they had enough to live. Mm -hmm. What was one of the first things they did when they got out of Egypt? They complained that Moses had taken them out of there because even in Egypt, even in bondage, even in the junk they lived in, they had what they needed to survive. I want you to know that there are some times where God has got to push you out of the plane to get you out of your comfort zone. Amen. There are some times where God has got to just push you off the mountain because you've gotten real comfortable there and let you go find the bottom of that valley so that he can bring you up to the other mountainside. Mm -hmm. There are times where we get so comfortable in what we're doing that we are afraid to make a move. We get so comfortable because we, 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 we've, we've got in this, in this mindset that if we just keep doing what we're doing now, everything is going to be the same. Everything is going to be fine. Nothing will happen. If I know that if I walk from this side right here and I get right here, I know that I've got enough room to stop and I can walk to the other side. And I know that when I walk over here, that I can get to the edge over here and because Jerry built this the way that he did, I'm not going to fall. I know that. But guess what? The same thing right here, but there's some times where you just got to go ahead and walk on off and get on a solid ground that you didn't think would be solid and get out of a comfort zone so that God can do something new in your life. Sometimes you just got to take a step down off of the ledge and get down to another level where God has you because guess what he does? When you get to one level and you get up here and you say, and the Lord is like, I want you down here. There's a reason he wants you to come down here because he wants to get you out of your comfort zone. He wants to get you out of your comfort zone so that then he can take you across the valley and bring you to another mountaintop. If you don't get out of your comfort zone, you will stay where you are and you will stay stagnant forever. There are ministers that have retired that they got in comfort zones and they didn't want to move any further because they felt like they'd done all they needed to do. There's some of us that won't look for new jobs because we're comfortable in the ones we have. There's some of us, let me say this, and I love every one of you, but there's some of you that don't want to go further with this because you're comfortable where you are now. Because you're scared of where God will take you. Hallelujah. There was a time, and I'm telling you guys, there was a time that I was so terrified of where God would take me, I wouldn't budge. I was good and happy right back here in the corner. Mm -hmm. I was far away from everybody. I was good. I didn't want to go further with God. I was good over here. I could stay all the way back here on this wall because you guys were further away from me. But see, God didn't like that. So guess what God started doing? You may have played video games before and the floor starts falling out from running. You've got to move forward. Yeah. So God, yeah. All his funniness. God started taking pieces of the flooring and removing them out from under my feet. But guess what he said? Psalms 119, 105 says, The Bible, the, the word of God will be a lamp unto your feet. Yes. And so as he took out sections of the floor, as he removed sections of the floor so that I had to get out of my comfort zone. You see, used to I'd be terrified to walk up here if y'all saw what it was before. God only knows how far I'd be under the mountain. But you see, God started pulling pieces of the floor out because it forced me to walk forward. I'm not afraid to walk forward in God anymore. I'm not afraid to run the aisles of the church. I'm not afraid to run from side to side. I'm not afraid to jump up and down and shout and holler. I'm not afraid to fall out in the spirit when the Holy Spirit falls upon me and I can't stand into my own strength. But if you don't get out of your comfort zone, you will never receive the fullness of God's blessings. I don't get up here and do anything with this for any of you. Don't take that the wrong way. I want you to see something here. The Bible doesn't say if you're a great singer to shout to the Lord. The Bible doesn't say that if you're MC Hammer to dance before the Lord. It doesn't say any of that. I understand some people are not comfortable getting up here and speaking in front of people. Some people are. It doesn't bother me. I love it. The reason I love it is because I get to share what God gives me with you. Hallelujah. Because what God is giving me is to make me better, and I'm hoping that what I'm sharing with you will make you better. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. But you see, if we don't get out of, can you imagine? How many of you, I'm going to ask a serious question. Any control freaks in here? Any OCD people in here? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Anthony's like, we need to raise it twice. Just, you know, something to people. Let me tell you this. How many of you were here Wednesday night? What word did I say that you had to do before you could receive the anointing? Submit. Can you imagine? Y'all know, y'all know where I'm going with this, don't you? Y'all know most of the things that we try to control in our life are irrelevant anyways. That's right. And then the grand scheme of things that don't matter. If if it were my way, I'd have people over at our house all the time. Allison would kill me, okay? You can say that. Her thing would be the house isn't clean, but we live here. Okay? It's not going to be clean every second of every day. We have children, and she has a husband that's a klutz, and a cl he's cluttered and all that stuff. The more time that we spend trying to control things that we shouldn't even be worried about, it's the less amount of time that we can spend being submissive to God and getting out of our comfort zones. When God shared that with me this morning, I was like, oh, my God. Like, and at the end of that, he's like, son, I love you. Sometimes messages aren't always the best thing, the easiest thing to hear. I know this one might have been a tough one this morning, but I feel like God is wanting some breakthroughs to happen in our lives. Man. I feel like God is, is willing to, he's wanting to take some of us deeper than we've ever gone before. I remember the first time that I ever jumped into a swimming pool in the deep end, I was terrified. My dad pushed me in. It was not fun. But guess what happened? I'm still here today, aren't I? Amen. I learned how to come up real fast. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, man. He pushed me in. See, I want you to stay over here in a little end. I want to stay over here in a little, you know, small little pool. But my dad knew that I'd never learned how to swim and swim well if he didn't put me in the deep end where I couldn't touch. Amen. I think I was like four or five, maybe. Maybe three or four. I was little. My mom got mad. Let's just say that. We'll leave it there. But there's sometimes you need to fall into this and dive into this and just get immersed into this and submit into this yeah. and leave everything else behind. There are times if you stay in your comfort zone Cut this off and use them way off the news here. If you stay in your comfort zone, you will miss what God has for you. Amen. I'm not saying that today somebody needs to jump up and shout and holler. I'm not saying today that somebody needs to run up here and say, I feel the, the leading of the Holy Spirit to be the worship leader. I'm not saying those kind of things. But what I am saying is, if you stay in the territory that you're familiar with and you only do the things that you're comfortable with, God will never have a chance to grow you like he wants to. Hallelujah. Those kids back there, God is going to grow them because right now they don't care about control. Mm -hmm. Right now they don't care about anything else but being back there and having fun and hearing the word. Some of them don't even realize it right now, but they're hearing the word of God. It won't hit them until they have this moment and this encounter with the Holy Ghost. And when they have that encounter, it's going to establish something. But if they were too afraid and too scared to get out of the comfort zone, they wouldn't go back there. Now, I'm not saying that a parent should ever force a child, if they're screaming and hollering, to go to kids' church. Hallelujah. And I'm going to say this and I'm going to close it down, but sometimes we kick and scream and holler ourselves and God pulls us to where we need to be. When I was 25 years old, I was comfortable. I had just finished playing professional baseball. That was over. I was living at home. I had no bills. I had no responsibilities. I might have been 23, I can't remember, 23, 24. No bills, no responsibilities. My parents had a business so I could work when I wanted to. I could fish. Like video games, you have to clean my room, nothing. I had zero responsibility in life. 
Yes, I was dating Allison, and she hated that, and I would not get my stuff together. But I was comfortable. Oh, I was good. I had a couch in my room. <laughs> I, had a, I had a 65 inch TV in my room. I had surround sound. Man, when I played NCAA football, you'd have thought I was at a football stadium. Can't tell you how many times my dad come out and you have got to turn this down. I'm like, listen, it's the experience. I had zero responsibility. I also had zero spiritual growth. No way. This right here had more spiritual growth in it than I had at that time in life. And that's saying something. So what did God do? God intervened. He put a plan into action. Mm -hmm. He packed my bags. He put me on an airplane. And he shipped me all the way out to Alaska. And you want to talk about getting pulled out of a comfort zone real fast? Well, he wanted to show me. I didn't have to wait until I got to Anchorage to see snow. It snowed that morning in Atlanta. That snowed in Atlanta in eight years. Mm -hmm. And here I am getting on an airplane at, at you know, Hartsville Jackson at like 7.30 in the morning. And it's snowing outside. And they have no clue what to do to get their eyes off the plane. I thought, well, this is starting out great. <laughs> I got to Anchorage. There was 14 feet of snow on the ground. Sometimes, just sometimes, you've got to let God change your spiritual environment Amen. so that you can get out of the environment that you were comfortable Amen. Did you get to the place in your worship today by staying comfortable? Nope. Did you get to the place of being comfortable as a mechanic by staying comfortable and just working on lawnmowers? Mm -mm. Wood? Did you get comfortable? And stay there. Nope. Yeah. Break. And I wish I had my sledgehammer, but I promise Christina I won't make a big mess again for a while. Seriously, <laughs> Y'all can see pieces of the uh, the uh, the blocks and the holes and the and the you know, yeah, yeah. we repurposed. Let God break your comfort zone. Yeah. Watch what he does. I didn't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit because I was comfortable. I was desperate. I was desperate for a move of God in my life. Amen. And I needed him more than I ever needed him. And not only did I receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but I lost my job. God wanted me twice as much. Mm -hmm. When you get out of your comfort zone, He can put you where you belong. Amen. Amen. Did you stand with me this morning? Amen. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you this morning and I give you honor and glory. I thank you, God, for every breaking moment in our lives, every breakthrough moment. Every transition, every move, everything that you do, God, to move us forward. Yes, Lord. I thank you, God, that when we are in the valley of decisions, that we don't have to do it alone. Yeah. Just as you asked Ezekiel, can it be done? You gave him the faith and the courage to make the decision to say, yes, it could. Yes. God, I pray today for these people that you would give them courage, that you would inspire them, that you would let them know that when they're in the valley of decision, that they're not alone. Hallelujah. When they're seeking out answers and direction and guidance, God, that you're right there with them. And Lord, I pray this morning that something that would have been said today would have sparked some thoughts in the minds of your people. Yes. Yes. God, I love you this morning. I thank you. I praise you. I give you honor and glory. And the church said, Amen. 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 I love you guys. This is the end of our service, but you guys are going to do that. But I love each and every one of you guys. Y'all have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. And I will see you guys Wednesday night at 7 p.m. for service here in our sanctuary. God bless you guys. I love you all.